It's my pleasure to open this session. First, we're going to hear from one of our past ACNS presidents, Dr. Gloria Galloway from The Ohio State University. Dr. Galloway. And the V is very important because there was a trademark case to try to get that V uh, put in, so very important. So I'm really honored uh, to be able to talk about uh, the Jasper Award here and present this. Um, it's presented annually to an individual who has made a lifetime of outstanding contributions to the field of clinical neurophysiology. And as a former fellow of uh, Dr. Yamada, I'm honored to have been asked to talk about uh, his exceptional career. So as many of you already know, Dr. Toru Yamada has spent decades teaching and mentoring residents and fellows at the University of Iowa, and he has served as professor of neurology and chief in the division of clinical electrophysiology. He has spent countless hours teaching EEG reading, intraoperative monitoring, and sleep throughout his career. And he's published over 300 peer-reviewed journal articles, reviews, and books in all aspects of clinical neurophysiology. He sits on numerous editorial journal boards and in society leadership positions, and he's mentored hundreds of US fellows, as well as students from abroad who desire to learn from him. In researching his numerous publications, it was amazing to see the degree to which Dr. Yamada's research branched down into a variety of subspecialties in both central and peripheral neurophysiology, attesting to his curiosity in the field and to his many contributions. His works have included research on evoked potentials, narcolepsy, sleep, electrocorticography, and motor nerve studies, both in humans and in animals. He's written extensively on all aspects of evoked potentials, as well as sleep neurophysiology and the neurophysiology of cognition and behavior. His passion for clinical neurophysiology was apparent during my fellowship, and he would become animated in fellow rounds, often mixed with humor. Therefore, when I saw that early on, in his career, he published an article in the journal Spine on the pathogenesis of idiopathic scoliosis in chickens. I couldn't just help but smile trying to imagine Dr. Yamada running after a scoliotic chicken and calling to it gently in Japanese. Some of my fondest memories as his fellow included reading EGs together. And at those fellow sessions, Dr. Yamada would discuss the nuances of EEG situations in which various patterns were found and often interjected examples. He was never hurried and enjoyed explaining the details of each case. And in those days, we had paper EEGs, and we would sit going through stacks of them for hours. Our intraoperative carotid studies would come into the lab by way of a paper recording with a needle moving the paper along slowly. So I know I'm aging myself here. Um, but he was an engaging professor. He is an engaging professor who taught by example, not by intimidation, and he strove to instill in his fellows his love of clinical neurophysiology. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the definition of a mentor is a trusted counselor or guide. Mentors push us and dare us to believe we can do more than we believe we can. Mentors often see something in us that we can't see in ourselves, and Dr. Yamada is this kind of mentor. Now, what many of you may not know is that Dr. Yamada has many side hobbies, some of which may surprise you, but these really helped extend my learning as a fellow outside of clinical neurophysiology. So fellows were often invited to Dr. Yamada's home, where he and his wife, Pat, were gracious hosts. On one such outing, I learned how to play and won my first game of poker. Another hobby of his is his passion for piloting. And now, as often as possible, he flies a small plane around the fields of Iowa. He often tells me he's planning a trip to Columbus, Ohio, but I've yet to see him overhead in the Buckeye State. So without further delay, it's my honor to present to my mentor, my Shizho, my sensei, the 2023 Herbert Jasper Award to Dr. Toru Yamada for his lifetime contributions to clinical neurophysiology. <laughs> 
I just want to make a few words. That's uh, glorious, glorious mentioned. That's too much, though. When, in fact, when I received notice, I thought there was a big mistake here. I shouldn't get this one. And, but after all, Dr. Jasper, Harvard Jasper was fairly close to Iowa. He was graduate from University of Iowa in 1931 with PhD degree in psychology. And after that, he went on to the Montreal, Canada, uh, McGill University then, in 1941. And Iowa is one of the oldest EEG laboratory. In, there were six EEG laboratory in 1930s, late. One of, Iowa is one of them. And then Iowa created many pioneers EEG years. Dr. John Knott, Charles Henry, and Dr. Nida Maya, and even Dr. Wada was one time uh, in Iowa. And then more recently, actually, we had two past presidents, uh, Dr. Mark Ross and Dr. Gloria, Ross, <laughs> Gloria Galloway. He was, uh, uh, she, they were the new past president of this society. And then Dr. Jasper was creator of the EG society, actually, former uh, name of this society, actually. And he's one first and second president of this uh, society, actually. And he was creator of the 1020 system, able to use it. And he was also, uh, he knows uh, Penfield Jasper's central encephalic theory of uh, generalized seizures. And, and then, uh, this is about in Dr. Jasper's very famous. So I'm, I'm, re I'm receiving his award with humble acceptance. Thank you. Thank you for support. Now it starts in 1974. That's the first picture that I have. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce this year's recipient of the Pierre Glore Award. This award is given to a neurophysiologist who's made an outstanding contribution to central clinical neurophysiology. And this year, I have the privilege of being able to introduce our award winner and our Glor Award lecturer, Thomas Black. You can see him here at Rush University, uh, where he started his career. This picture is from 1974. Uh, he went on to hold a number of different roles at Rush before he became a professor emeritus uh, and really launched neurocritical care as a field. I think that uh, that was before he was able to get promoted to grandpa, as the shirt does say on, on the side. I think of all the many different accomplishments that he's had, he founded the Neurocritical Care Society. He's been an editor in many journals and currently a senior editor for the journal Critical Care. He has well over 200 publications, many thousands of citations of his work. I think for me, one of the most impressive accomplishments are some of the unsung and potentially less glamorous contributions that he's made to the field. You take a look at his CV, he serves on any number of data safety monitoring boards. He's on the SIREN steering committee for NIH to help lead clinical research in neurocritical care topics. These are the kinds of things that take a lot of work, a lot of dedication towards the field to help move things forward, even if it's not necessarily the thing that puts your name up in lights or, or gets as much individual attention, but really all of the landmark work that's happened over the last several decades in neurocritical care, he's had one hand in one way or another, um, most recently with the ESET trial, which I think was uh, a landmark study in our area. Can you do the next slide, please? Early on, he published one of the first uh, papers describing treatment of refractory status epilepticus. And looking at the meeting today, it's sort of hard to believe that there wasn't a lot of work in this area until recently, um, but really pioneering that idea that you can treat refractory status epilepticus and you can gather evidence about how to treat it and what might be effective and what not. He also uh, published work about altered mental status due to non-convulsive status epilepticus. And again, as you look at the meeting now, this is something that we've come to recognize as a large problem for both patients who have primary neurologic problems, but also patients who are in the ICU with medical problems. And so some of what we learned came from those initial reports describing that, um, that contribution to altered mental status. <laughs> 
More recently, he was one of the co-authors on the ACNS consensus statement about continuous EEG monitoring in critically ill adults and children. And on the standardized terminology for rhythmic and periodic EEG patterns, that original ICU EEG paper that's become such a landmark and has served as the bedrock for subsequent iterations. So for all of these reasons, while he's a giant in neurocritical care, he's also a giant for us as neurophysiologists in really bringing together the disciplines, bringing true critical care, I think he's boarded in six specialties at this point, true critical care, medicine, as well as neurology, as well as clinical neurophysiology, and having them come together in a way that helps us take the best care for our patients has opened up an entirely new field of inquiry in clinical care for our patients. And for that reason, I can think of nobody more deserving for this year's PR Glore Award than Thomas Black. Please help me congratulate him, and we'll have the privilege of hearing him speak. Well, Courtney, thank you very much for that over-the-top introduction. But I'm sure my grandchildren will enjoy the pictures at some point. So as a, an entree to this, I should say one of my professors used to talk about one of his predecessors, a guy named George Katsias, by saying that he was the Christopher Columbus of movement disorders because he didn't know where he was going when he started. He didn't know where he was when he got there. And even though he wasn't first, he took all the credit. And I will try to convince you that those three uh, attributes uh, characterize my career. So I'm going to talk about Hans Berger meeting ECMO. These are my disclosures. The only one I should mention is that I continue to do some work with Sarah Bell, and I will mention a rapid EEG uh, later in the talk. So I mentioned this uh, title to my friend Adriana, who misunderstood what I said and thought this was going to be the topic of my lecture. Well, maybe that would have been a better one. We'll see. These are the previous recipients of the GLORE Award, and many are in this room here, and I'm really honored and humbled to be in this company. These are two of the past presidents of what was then the American EEG Society. In 1978, Frank Morell, who was my mentor in epilepsy, and in 1979, Pierre GLORE. They were both fellows of Dr. Jasper, so I'm happy that I can dovetail into Dr. Yamada's talk here. And I had the privilege of getting to know Dr. Gluer through Dr. Morell at several meetings. He was a very impressive person to know. Um, this, by the way, is Berger's original EEG machine, which probably wouldn't survive the trip to the ICU, much less be able to record much in that environment. His original publications included a lot of hand drawings of the recordings he saw. As you can see in each of them, there's a tracing that we might consider the alpha rhythm above what was then the beta rhythm. He did describe what he called unconsciousness here um, with loss of the alpha and persistence of beta, but all the patients who were unconscious uh, in his study were ones who were in his laboratory and had a convulsion uh, and then were postictal, and that's what he described for unconsciousness. Uh, so this is the uh, PubMed number of citations for EEG and ICU together. Uh, the first one was in 1964. When I started medical school in 73, there were five that year. When I finished my fellowship, there were four. By the time I moved to Virginia, there were still four. Um, more recently, uh, 40, and now last year, 137. So the literature has grown quite a bit, but it's still uh, really insufficient to explain many of the things we need to know. This wasn't the first one, but it's the first important one. This is Hackaday et al. Uh, talking about the EEG changes in acute anoxia. So they went to the uh, intensive care area at Mass General and started recording people. And as you'll see, the grades that they found are very similar to the Sinec grades that were uh, done usual. They didn't really pick up on first suppression. But uh, I think it's important to look at some of what they did. So if you look down at table three, they had their grades of EEG abnormality compared to uh, the total number and the surviving number of patients. <clears throat> 
And footnote number one sort of stuck in, uh, I think, without a lot of thought was that, oh, some of these records have epileptiform activity, uh, something we'd probably pay more attention to now. In 1969, uh, Pamela Pryor and her colleagues came up with this device uh, that is eerily similar to amplitude integrated EEG. Uh, this is the first real so-called cerebral function monitor. And they published some of their studies. The one on the lower right there is uh, recording over several hours in somebody with a barbiturate overdose showing that the activity went from uh, fairly low amplitude to much higher amplitude as the patient recovered. This is a publication by Max Sadoff, who was the chair of anesthesia when I was a medical student, uh, noting that if a skilled anesthesiologist had an EEG, it would be useful, but most of the time it was useless. This is the first uh, publication I can see that had a compressed spectral array. This was uh, Reg Bickford's work when he was still in San Diego. Um, obviously not a great reproduction of it, but this was the first notion that you could compress data and display a lot of time on a single page. Well, when I was a fellow and a young attending, this was an EEG machine that you used. It was about four feet long, fairly heavy, but had good wheels. And uh, you could take it up to the intensive care unit if you were really brave. And you can imagine how much of the space this took up next to a bed. Uh, so the nurses were never all that happy when I would say we need to do an EEG because it took up a lot of their room. Now, the recording was uh, 10 seconds per page. So if you did 24 hours, that's 8,640 pages. When we did epilepsy monitoring, we did it at half speed, but that's still a whole box of paper every day. And worse than that, somebody's got to look at it. Right? So over time, the, probably the biggest advance in critical care EEG has been in data reduction. At that time, I was taught that a birth suppression EEG meant that synaptic transmission was blocked, and therefore a seizure could not occur. And the people who knew that knew it because they knew it, not because they'd ever actually studied it. And as a consequence, uh, you would come in, turn on the machine for a few minutes, if you saw about 10 seconds per burst, then you'd turn it off and come back in a few hours. If the bursts were too close, you'd increase the barbiturates, and if the bursts were too far apart, you'd hold it for a while. And that was the treatment of refractory status. Also the same treatment for increased intracranial pressure. But one day I turned on the machine and then I got distracted and let it run. So this is your continuous record, 10 second page. So we've got a burst, some suppression, a burst, some more suppression, another burst, more suppression. So I thought, well, this looks pretty good, but I forgot to turn it off. And then I saw this. This is a bipolar left over right. So, well, what's a 14-second seizure among friends? This brain's pickled in thiopental, uh, but I better keep watching to see what happens. And sure enough, you saw this. Now, this patient's paralyzed. This is not neuromuscular activity. This is a real seizure happening when it's impossible to have one. I still don't know the mechanism of either the bursts or why seizures can break through with this supposedly complete synaptic blockade, but it's obviously not complete. And it obviously means that burst suppression doesn't protect you from having seizures. So these were things I thought of as myths about burst suppression, that it was either necessary or sufficient. And uh, Frank Drizzling has shown this uh, quite well. I also thought I could pretty easily teach this pattern to non-neurologists. And I would come in in the morning and people would say, you know, I gave grams and grams of pentobarbital um, and I couldn't get these bursts more than six seconds apart. And there's a ventilator artifact every six seconds. The EEG is as flat as the state of Kansas and stays that way for days. Those patients did pretty well, which I think is still something I need to understand. But anyway, I don't think of these as myths anymore. These are nitwitticisms. They're things that sound smart, but they're really stupid. So we give these anesthetic drugs. I'm not an anesthetist or an anesthesiologist. Uh, I did play one at Rush on the faculty. Uh, but it's important to think about what we're doing, because importantly, drugs like midazolam and ketamine by themselves are not going to produce birth suppression no matter how much you give. They'll eventually make the EEG flat. Now, a damaged brain in the uh, setting of midazolam, plus if there's a little propofol around, yeah, you'll get some birth suppression. 
but those drugs themselves don't do it, and therefore that shouldn't be the target, uh, whatever target we're going to use. I'm also standing up here to tell you that I'm not always sure what I'm looking at. So this was a highly immunosuppressed patient who had uh, meningitis and brain abscesses with a particularly nasty fungus. He's not having any uh, movements visible. He looks comatose. There's a, been a burr hole for biopsy near F4, which explains why some of the activity is higher amplitude and a little faster there. But as you'll notice, about eight seconds into the recording, things get relatively flat, sort of a decremental event. And then starts to come back in that area and starts to spread out and continues. And then you see a run of faster activity. And then all of a sudden, whoops, go back on. Uh, in the third second here, you get that same pattern again. So any one page here, I'd say, well, there's some maybe rhythmic interactal activity, but is it a seizure? And I think this is uh, what Larry Hirsch and his colleagues have described as cyclic seizures. The pattern itself just keeps repeating over and over again and was eventually interrupted with anti-seizure drugs. Well, I have my own classification of status. It's status. It's not status. I'm not sure if it's status. And post anoxic myoclonus is not, is not, and is not a form of status epilepticus. Now, sometimes the spell check gets ahead of us, and a friend of mine wanted to write about non convulsive status, but the computer changed it to non conclusive status. And maybe that's a better term than just I'm not sure. Well, the group that uh, was led by Dr. Van Putin, who spoke to us quite eloquently yesterday, uh, running the Telstar study. For those of you who don't know what Telstar is, it's the communication satellite that's up there on the right. Uh, again, showed that myoclonus, no matter what you want to call it, does not respond to anti-seizure drugs. Well, in 1990, I moved to the University of Virginia. And this was my EEG machine. It's a little smaller. It's a little easier to move. On the other hand, if I wanted it at night or weekends, I had to do it all myself. Uh, one difference, by the way, in doing it myself was that at Rush, every EEG all the time was done with collodion. And here I had paste, so I could put it on a lot faster. But nevertheless, there was no one to help me with it. But we did uh, manage to monitor some patients. Now, I should tell you, Anand Kumar was one of my... <clears throat> excuse me, medical critical care fellows at Rush. And he came to my office one day and said, what do you think about midazolam for refractory status? And I started to babble incoherently about why it was pharmacokinetically not the ideal drug. And after I went on for a few minutes, he stopped me and said, well, I tried it in two patients and it worked. So then I was smart enough to shut up and listen. And that's really been my whole career. Stop talking and listen. So these were a couple other patients then that we studied, a total of seven. And as happened, the first seven patients uh, with refractory status all responded to high-dose intravenous midazolam. So I thought we were on to something. This illustration on the left, by the way, was one channel of an EEG that I printed out on paper, cut apart, and made it like you would see with an EMG raster set up, uh, just to get it all on one page, because I was presenting this to intensivists who could care less what the recording looked like. And uh, oh, I see my line slipped up again. But this was a before and after uh, of another one of the patients. So I thought this was pretty good stuff. But then I got really lucky, and Dick Moberg's here in the audience. And through an arrangement that we had with Hewlett Packard at the time, I managed to get a hold of one of these machines. Now, this was an eight-channel EEG recorder that put the EEG data onto this 24-hour removable hard drive. And then I could both watch it as it was going on, but I could also put it in another machine and go back and look at the whole 24 hours. Well, if I looked page by page, it would be another 24 hours. But you can see uh, already on this that there was also a compressed spectral array. And this was displaying the 95% spectral edge frequency. By the way, to get a hard copy of this EEG, you triggered the laser printer down at the bottom, and that's how you printed things out. So this is a recording from one of the patients. These are uh, four left parietal, or left mesial temporal over four right mesial temporal bipolars. You can see toward the end something rhythmic is emerging and goes on to be a nice well-formed seizure and then stops with some postictal slowing. <clears throat> 
So that's all right. But if I had to read the whole 24 hours in real time, I wasn't really gaining that much. But you could put this spectral edge display up, and you can see when there was a seizure in this patient. Now, this doesn't happen to everyone, but obviously in this patient where the background was pretty suppressed by uh, barbiturates and the seizure moved the spectral edge out, you could find the seizure pretty easily. But you can then flip this on its side by time, and this was the first time you could take a cursor, find one of these peaks, and pull up the raw EEG. And this is how we did real ICU monitoring, probably for the first time. Now, Larry likes to blame me for starting the field. It's really uh, Dick's fault, not mine. So in 1997, uh, the Earth moved, which was Mark Quigg took over the EEG lab from me so I could get back to uh, running the ICU more. And he introduced 24-hour video EEG with technologists. And that still is the best thing because now I can just ask for one. All right, so we did a little more work on propofol and midazolam uh, as treatments for refractory status. And in so doing, showed that uh, there were more deaths with propofol. We didn't understand propofol infusion syndrome at the time, we probably played into it. But it wasn't a randomized trial, it was just a suggestion that uh, maybe at least midazolam was still pretty good, although I have to say probably more propofol is used now. Paul Vespo was one of my residents, and when he went to work with Mark Neuer at UCLA, came up with this notion of poor to excellent uh, relative alpha variability as a marker for preclinical onset of vasospasm and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this technology was uh, quite precise, which was they posted this uh, diagram up, and you sort of matched your relative alpha variability up to what it looked like on the diagram, and then you said this patient was good or fair or whatever. Uh, but he found that this actually occurred about two days before the patient started to have symptomatic vasospasm, and a day before the transcranial Doppler velocities increased. Uh, so this was a real preclinical marker. Now, we're still stuck with the, what do we do with that information? Right? We're not going to go in and do angioplasties uh, on patients before they're symptomatic because there have been some aneurysmal, I'm mean, some uh, carotid ruptures from trying to angioplasty preclinically. So we don't have a good treatment yet, but once we come up with one, uh, we'll still be using this kind of technology. And here's a much more recent uh, publication from some of the people who are in this room showing this increase in uh, alpha delta ratio, which is really a very similar phenomenon. Uh, Jean Gottman, who's here in the audience, had gotten interested in EEG monitoring and came up with what I think is probably technologically one of the best systems still that would be available. Well, what do we do with some of the information we get? Well, uh, Paul Vespa, again, leading this study looking at a rapid EEG system, showed that having rapid EEG uh, obtained in the emergency department or uh, in a patient who starts seizing somewhere else allows you to be much more confident in the decisions you're going to make uh, rather than waiting for uh, regular EEG, or in this case, sort of what was your pre-EEG notion. Now, this isn't the only rapid EEG system around. It's the one we happen to use. Uh, but I think the future is in getting people connected much earlier and being able to manage them much more precisely. Well, one of the other things we deal with uh, quite frequently in the intensive care unit is post-anoxic coma. And although the use of EE, or sorry, evoke potentials for prognostication really started decades before this down in New Zealand, uh, this was one of the first major studies that uh, showed that you could uh, use, in this case, the N20 response as a predictor of outcome. Now, uh, the way this was done, it's a predictor of poor outcomes. It doesn't have much to say about good outcomes. The other thing you'll notice that these were recorded up to 72 hours after the return of spontaneous circulation, and buried in the methods is the statement that this allowed us to be sure we could get everybody done Monday through Friday so the techs didn't have to come in on the weekend. Uh, nowadays, uh, trying to improve on this, it looks like perhaps the amplitude of that response, in addition to its latency, will uh, allow us to help perhaps make predictions of good outcomes uh, added on. Now, we haven't done this yet where I work, uh, but I would like to get it started. You can see just amplitude measurements here. Of course, if you're going to do this now, you have to have really well standardized uh, norms for your own lab for 
uh, what these amplitudes as well as the latency should be. We see a lot of ECMO patients. For those of you who aren't familiar with ECMO, I'm going to explain a little bit about it. Uh, basically, there are a lot of neurologic complications that can occur. Um, I'm, of course, very interested in seizures and status, but uh, I see these patients in consultation routinely. And sort of being back in residency because the equipment does not allow you to get magnetic resonance imaging. If you're lucky, you can get a CT scan. But it's difficult to move the equipment, but it's doable. Uh, but all these things that happen uh, are going to be happening in an environment that was much more like the one in which I was trained. If you're interested, this is probably the best recent review looking at neurologic complications. And you'll notice on the right, there's a distinction between what's called VA and VV ECMO. So veno-arterial ECMO, as I'll show you in a diagram, takes deoxygenated blood from the venous system, oxygenates it, gets rid of carbon dioxide, pumps it back into the arterial tree under arterial pressure. VV does the same thing, but it puts the bl oxygenated blood back under venous pressure, just a little bit higher than what came out, uh, and then it goes through the lungs and onto the heart. Well, it turns out that intracerebral hemorrhage isn't just a complication of having either too much anticoagulation or throwing small emboli, but one of the major causes of intracerebral hemorrhage in VB ECMO patients is rapidly dropping the PCO2. And we'd seen this before in some neuromuscular uh, respiratory failure patients who had been slowly failing, had PCO2s of 100 or more with a lot of renal compensation, who we then put on a ventilator with fairly standard settings for an adult. So put on a ventilator with a rate of 12 and tidal volume of 600, their PCO2 goes from 100 down to 35, their pH goes to 7.75, and they're comatose from vasoconstriction, and sometimes they bled. So if you're ever lowering the PCO2 like that, you want to do it over a day or so, not over a couple of minutes. So this is a VV setup. The blue line coming out of the femoral vein shows the blood going into a pump. These pumps also uh, control temperature. However, you can't use it for therapeutic temperature management because there's no feedback from the patient. Uh, to know what the patient's temperature is. So you still have to have some other system that allows you to measure the patient's temperature in order to keep it corrected. The uh, red line coming out of the artificial lung, then in this case is going uh, into a carotid artery. Now that's what you see in infants where the right carotid is sacrificed and the blood is reinfused into the right carotid. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be going into the uh, jugular vein here. So you could have a jugular catheter. So this is VV. It's coming from a vein, going into a vein. And now oxygenated blood is flowing through the lungs, getting to the left side of the heart, and being pumped out to the body. For VA ECMO, uh, you have a couple different options. One is if on the left, the central cannulation, that's a patient who couldn't come off the pump in the operating room. They already had cannulae uh, in and around the heart, so they just use the same ones. Uh, if you're starting this after a cardiac arrest or for some other reason, here they show blood coming out of the iliac vein. Goes through the same circuit we saw before, but now comes back under high pressure uh, into a femoral artery. And you notice the blood going up. And when it gets up to the top of the aorta, they show blue blood coming out of the ventricle. Right? So... If the heart's not working at all, the system is very easy to run. You know what the PO2 is everywhere because it's what you are pumping back into the patient. But as the heart starts to recover, if there was a cardiac problem, but the lungs aren't normal yet, then deoxygenated blood is coming through the non-functioning lungs and starts to compete with the oxygenated blood coming in from the pump. And the point where the two mix uh, is going to be very important. Unfortunately for the heart, the first place that deoxygenated blood is going is in the coronary arteries. Right? So even though the heart is functioning better, it's not getting good oxygenation. As the heart starts to improve, then that deoxygenated blood goes up higher and higher in the ascending aorta and eventually gets uh, out to the subclavian. And one of the reasons these patients need to have right radial arterial lines is so that you can measure the PO2 of the blood that the upper part of the body is seeing, because you know it's probably 300 or whatever's coming out of the pump in the lower part of the body. And this has been called piebald syndrome because you're two different colors, or it's north-south, whatever you want to call it. 
And one of the important reasons to figure out whether the brain is getting adequate oxygenation is because if it's not, you want to be able to fix something. Uh, and there are tricks you can try to do to try and improve the oxygenation of that venous blood. So this is a, another illustration of that. You can see as the blue blood gets better, it's starting to fill up all the great vessels now. Well, so how can you monitor this? Well, one of the ways that this is uh, standardly done is with near-infrared spectroscopy. You have you know, sensors that are over the forehead and then sensors on the legs. Why do you care about the legs? Because the cannula returning the blood into the femoral artery is about the same diameter as the artery, and the leg can become ischemic. Now, most of us deal with that by having a little bypass that goes distally into the femoral artery. Uh, but the nurse system is really good at picking up leg ischemia, and it's sort of good at picking up brain ischemia. I think the reason it's sort of good is that what the leg is doing is really unaffected by anesthesia, but the signal you're getting from the brain is going to be affected by a lot of things, some of which are related just to oxygen delivery. But if you start to see a difference between hemispheres on the saturation on the nears, you need to fix that as fast, best you can. Um, Pupillometry is listed as something to do here. I haven't really done much of that. EEG I do as monitoring, again, looking for differences between the sides uh, in this circumstance, and also, of course, looking for seizures. Uh, evoke potentials, you could do evoke potential monitoring for the same purpose. Of course, your SSCPs are crossing over uh, once you get into the brainstem, so hopefully you'd get a detection of a problem in that N20 response, assuming that the N13s got where they're supposed to be. Uh, this is one of the patients we cared for, a 19-year-old girl with cystic fibrosis who had had many episodes of hypoxemia and pulmonary hemorrhage, so she'd been anoxic many times before she got onto ECMO. And we we're trying to figure out uh, what was her neurologic status. Uh, she had sluggish pupils, but otherwise couldn't be examined because of a neuromuscular junction blockade. Uh, so here are the somatosensory evoke potentials. Uh, so we have good herbs point, good N13, and we do have an N18, but there's no N20. Right, so now she's not dead, and I know that to start with because her pupils work, and I also had an EEG that showed low amplitude slow activity. Uh, but in this circumstance, again, that lack of the N20 uh, potential on both sides is a harbinger of bad things to come. So just recently, like yesterday, the Neurocritical Care Society published guidelines for prognostication in comatose adult survivors of cardiac arrest, which I uh, commend for your reading uh, as a way to uh, try and add up all the different modalities we have for prognostication here. I won't go over them in detail. I will, however, tell you how I teach my ICU colleagues to read an EEG. I tell them it's very simple. A normal EEG looks like ventricular fibrillation. A normal EEG has no periodic components except during stage two sleep. And the more your EEG looks like sinus rhythm, the worse off you are, right? So if you know those things, you're in pretty good shape. Activity in the front of the head should be faster than it is in the back of the head. And if you're in doubt, stimulate the patient because reactivity is good uh, no matter how the EEG looks otherwise. Well, we have a couple other studies going on now to help understand what goes on with patients. One of them is uh, being run by, again, my former resident, Paul Vespa, Epilepsy Bioinformatics Study, which has a number of things being studied, including uh, both surface EEG and depth EEG, looking for predictors of later epilepsy. There is both a human and an animal component to this study, and I think one of the underappreciated things that's come out of the animal work already is the effect of fluid percussion injury on the rat brain. So. People have used fluid percussion as a model of brain injury for decades, and it's been assumed all this time that the changes you see when you do lateral fluid percussion that produces cellular damage in the hippocampus was a consequence of some traveling wave of pressure. Uh, but in this study, the animals get instrumented for EEG before the fluid percussion injury. And 70% of the animals are in non-convulsive status for a day or more after the fluid percussion injury. So I think it's quite likely that a lot of the pathology we have looked at as a consequence of trauma may in fact be a secondary consequence of the trauma causing seizures. And this is something we need to study in a lot more detail. 
So there are many parts to this study. I don't have time to go over all of them. I'm lucky to remain part of it at all. Some of the other things we're looking at, this is from Brian Edlow at Harvard, uh, looking at patients who are in the recovery phase after traumatic brain injury and doing studies that involve both EEG and functional MRI uh, in the setting of trying to activate the brain with methylphenidate. Uh, we've studied several patients already, but we're obviously still in the infancy of this. And the EEG parameters of this are really quite important in understanding what goes on. We're looking toward being able to use a closed loop sedation system in the intensive care unit uh, by various EEG measures that could then allow us to uh, tune a, a drug like midazolam or propofol. Of course, benzodiazepines in general have a bad rap for ICU sedation uh, because of the, their longer half-life. Even when you give a short drug like midazolam, that's active metabolites will accumulate and it'll be around for days uh, if you're giving more than just single injections. Um, and also there's the question of do the benzodiazepines cause more delirium than other drugs? Probably true. Uh, another way of looking at the question of what the EEG predicts is trying to figure out in the first uh, day or so uh, after an injury can you predict the long-term outcome? And this is looking at phase relationships between various parts, uh, uh, various measures from the EEG, uh, suggesting that you can, in fact, find things very early on that will predict prognosis. Part of the bugaboos of all these systems have been how often does somebody look at it and how often does it get reported? So Larry's been fond of saying we do continuous recording and intermittent analysis. Uh, this is... Uh, Actually, a couple of the authors are in the room here, Nicholas and Jim. If you have a frequency at which the EEG is being uh, analyzed, uh, you can see in this uh, survey of what's done, it's pretty intermittent information. So unless somebody in the ICU is looking at the monitor, you may miss seizures until somebody comes back and looks at it. You know, somebody's recently been trying to apply the Nyquist criterion to this frequency to see what we ought to do. The detection of covert consciousness is an area uh, in the intensive care unit that we're quite interested in and afraid of because we've now come to realize that there are a number, not a huge number, but a number of patients in whom there's no motor output and we assume that they are unresponsive, but their problem is they're de-efferented. Uh, this started, of course, with studies doing bold imaging and functional MRI of asking people to imagine either playing tennis or moving around their house and showing that they would activate areas of brain routinely as answers to questions. And there are now machine learning techniques to try and extract that information out of the EEG as well. And so this uh, suggestion is that uh, you can actually use a combination of these materials to try to detect the patients with covert consciousness without having to go through uh, doing a, a very long and tedious study in the magnet. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to pick up these people further or faster. Of course, the question then is what do we do for them? And if they're awake and often sentient, uh, uh, we need to treat them differently than we would someone who is truly unresponsive. You can also use some of the uh, older neuropsychological paradigms like P300s or mismatch negativity uh, to pick up patients who in fact have some degree of awareness, and maybe you do this as a screen before going on to the, uh, the, the more ex difficult uh, studies. Spreading to polarization has been brought up many times in this meeting. Um, there are a couple of things that go on here, but I think the main thing to keep in mind is that in a number of conditions, uh, you see spreading to polarization, and for the 30% or so of you who have migraine, that's what's happening as your scintillating scotoma is enlarging after which you then get the headache because of vasodilation related to all that extracellular potassium. But for some reason, patients with acute brain injuries, in particular subarachnoid hemorrhage, but also ischemic stroke and trauma, get vasoconstriction as a consequence of that. So there's some failure of coupling between uh, probably the potassium release and the nitric oxide effect on the vascular caliber. So they can get ischemia with delayed infarction, as we see in subarachnoid hemorrhage, related to the spreading depolarization. And at some point, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to say we have a drug or some combination of drugs that will inhibit uh, 
at least the vasoconstrictive portion of spreading depolarization or maybe inhibited completely. Uh, depth electrodes uh, in the setting of acute trauma where you have obvious surface recordings but also uh, someone can leave either a strip or a depth electrode behind finding a large number of seizures that we hadn't previously understood. Uh, there have been a few talks on that at this meeting already. Don't know what to do with that information. Should these things be suppressed? Uh, does it make a difference in outcome? I think we have a lot, long way to go here. Uh, the SIREN group, which is uh, a combination of workers from both the National Institute of Neurologic Disease and Stroke and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, focuses on studies that can be started in the emergency department but then are often carried on uh, up in the intensive care unit. The BOOST trial is the major trial looking at whether uh, measuring brain oxygen and treating it will improve outcome after a severe head injury. Uh, Emily Gilmore has a, a sub-study called ElectroBoost to see whether adding electrophysiology studies uh, can improve our ability to manage these patients. So uh, I was privileged to be part of the ESET group. I'm going to uh, talk about that just for a moment, but I've been doing this for a long time. This is my first paper. And for those of you who don't read cuneiform, I'll just give you the bottom line here, which was even back then they knew what to do. So these are the publications on status uh, over time. There was one back in 1897 that made it into Index Medicus, but when I started medical school, there were 18 papers on status. You can see how this has grown over the years. This was the sort of bottom line of ESET, which was that of these three drugs, levetiracetam at 60 milligrams per kilo, phosphenatoin at 20, or valproate at 40, there was not an obvious difference. You have to remember, though, what was success here. Success was you were no longer convulsing, and you had at least one step improvement in your RAS score. So there are probably patients who succeeded, uh, but didn't get that improvement in their RAS score, either because of their previous benzodiazepines or because they were postictal. Uh, so in the next stage of this, which I'll describe in a moment, we want to use one of the rapid EEG systems to try to make a very quick determination as to whether the seizures have been controlled. And see, of course, we're not going to try all three drugs again, and I'll talk about that again in just a second. Uh, people are mostly familiar with the New England Journal study from which that infographic was drawn. Uh, this one that was in The Lancet, though, uh, gives you breakdowns according to what the most likely successful drug or le least likely successful drug was in a particular age population. So, for example, in children, the drug that was most likely uh, to be efficacious, listed here, uh, Valproate, or if you look at the, the middle age range, then you had Phenytoin. So the point here was not that the study was powered to do this, but if you wanted to use this information, there'd be nothing wrong with using it. However, most people, I think, have said, well, Levetiracetam's easy to use, and now we can give it as a syringe IV push instead of having to give an infusion, uh, so we'll just go with that. Uh, you might wonder why there's no leucosamide in this. At the time this was done, we started it, leucosamide didn't have a pediatric indication, and these already had to have indications for the condition being treated. Uh, it was also going to be difficult to get it to look exactly the same as the other drugs so that the investigators would remain masked. On the right side of this slide, uh, the age groups are broken down even more finely, but again, now there are fewer and fewer subjects in each age range, and therefore I wouldn't make a whole lot of which drug was best on that basis. This is the ESET management group. Um, so we've been together now for a long time, and I can tell you that this picture proves conclusively that I am the tallest member of the group. <laughs> so other things that have come out of that, I don't you know if Eric's still here. Um, Eric and many of the others looked at the data on who got intubated, right? Well, it turns out that nothing about status epilepticus that you can measure determines who gets intubated. Nothing about the drugs determines who gets intubated. The main determinant of intubation is what center you're at, right? So there's really not been a consistent way, and we didn't have a consistent rule for why you got intubated. Uh, in the next stage, we hope to be able to harmonize this a little bit better so that we don't have intubation listed as a failure because this center intubates everybody 
and that center doesn't intubate anyone and their outcomes are the same. Uh, we've also looked at what happens uh, in the hours after you were found to be a success. And lo and behold, a lot of people started seizing again. That shouldn't have been a surprise, but uh, another reason why we need to have EEG that goes right from the start here. So what are we looking to do next? Uh, have a study, depending on your pronunciation, it's either Keyset or Cassette, uh, where we'll take levetiracetam as a single agent compared to levetiracetam plus one milligram per kilo of ketamine and lev plus three milligrams per kilo of ketamine. Now those doses are picked. The one milligram per kilo gets just over the predicted serum concentration that looks to be effective as an anti-seizure drug in animals. I'm not talking about protection against nerve damage as a consequence of status. I'm talking about what looks like an actual anti-seizure anti effect. The three uh, actually will get over the so-called dissociative uh, concentration that's predicted for humans. Uh, so we'll see, maybe it's more efficacious, but maybe there are more side effects. So anyway, uh, we had our first run through and the NIH, of course, gave us a lot of very nice suggestions as they're prone to do, but we did get a score. So we're hopeful it'll go up. I already mentioned the rapid EEG there. We're also looking to introduce rapid EEG devices into emergency departments in a stepped wedge fashion to see how being able to get this information in all patients who have altered awareness uh, affects the behavior of the emergency physicians. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, this is a short list of the people who have assisted in a lot of this work. I obviously uh, didn't do any of this by myself. I also want to call out my wife, Laura, who keeps me on the straight and narrow and uh, puts up with my inability to retire. So thank you very much. Thank you.